When Mary was born, she was a caesarean. And uh, she was brought from the delivery room in a blue blanket. And I said, oh, it's a boy. And the nurse said, well. My parents were expecting me. They used to talk about Christopher. Christopher never materialized. It was Barbara who came along. I was a lively, cheerful child. Loved playing with my Barbie doll, doll's house, teddy bear. But I knew every car on the road when I was five and had a huge collection of toy cars. My parents put me in dresses and girls' clothes, blouses and skirts. And I preferred trousers and jeans, more so as I got older as well. They did try to reinforce my gender identity as female, although I didn't need it reinforcing. I've always felt female. I am female. Though when I was growing up, I knew that I was a girl, I wasn't a very feminine one. I wasn't too interested in playing with Barbie dolls or in wearing high heels or using makeup. And once my diagnosis came out, I was a bit concerned with this, that it might have to do with my condition. I actually find hermaphrodite to be a rather poetic word, and I prefer it to some of the more clinical things. I would like it to be reclaimed, though, because it does have a hint of freakishness to it, and I don't think we need to think about these conditions as being freakish. Um, some other words like intersex seem to point too much to the fact that there are two sexes and something in between. It would be nice if we could have terms which show that there is a continuum and that there isn't this need to divide into two sexes or being between those two. Uh, looking at people like me can open up society to a more flexible view of gender, just like we don't think of blue as being a, female, uh, a male color or pink as being a female color anymore. Maybe we can stop looking at XY as being a male chromosome and XX as being female chromosomes. In my first year at girls' grammar school, we studied chromosomes in biology. A smear was taken from a girl's mouth and we all gawked down a microscope to have a look. I distinctly remember sitting there thinking the thought, if they do mine, it'll show male chromosomes. I sometimes wonder whether deep down we know more about ourselves than we are aware of. A year later, I started Latin. In the Latin language, nouns are divided into masculine, feminine and neuter. And one weekend, we visited friends in another town and their son had just started Latin too. When he introduced me to his friends, they wanted to know whether I was a girl or a boy. And he quite spontaneously replied, oh, she's neuter. I was quite intrigued and amused by the aptness of his comment. I grew up as a normal, healthy girl, and nobody knew anything about my intersex condition until I was about 13. At this point, my clitoris started to grow. When I was aroused, it was about two centimetres long. I was terribly embarrassed about it and thought it was because I'd been masturbating too much, so I didn't tell anybody. As time went on, I got a bit worried, so I approached the district nurse, who sent me to my GP, who packed me straight off to hospital. When I was born, I looked like a girl, and therefore I grew up just like all my other cousins, like a normal uh, Indian girl. And until the age of 16, I thought there was nothing different with me. Uh, by the time I was 16, though, I hadn't started menstruating yet, and therefore my parents took me to see the doctor. It took six months of tests for the doctor to find out that I did not have the uterus and ovaries that he was expecting to find, and that I had XY chromosomes and possibly testes inside of me. When they'd finished their tests, they told me they were going to have to do a bikini cut from hip to hip to do an internal examination. They didn't tell me what they were looking for and I didn't dare ask. My doctor suggested that I have a gonadectomy, that is, that I have my testes removed. He said that the main reason to do this was to avoid the 
testes to become cancerous because they were internal and therefore the raised temperature might make them cancerous. I was quite happy to go with this because I, frankly, I didn't want to have testes inside of me because I felt I was a woman and I, it was quite hard to uh, put together my image of myself and my gender and have testes inside of me. So um, we had that done when I was 17 years old, a few months after the diagnosis. When I came round after the operation, they told me they'd had to remove my ovaries because they hadn't been properly developed and might have caused cancer if they hadn't been taken out. This meant I'd never be able to have children. That was a terrible shock. As soon as everybody had left the room, I tried out to see if my clitoris still worked. I think I was pretty worried that they were going to be cutting around at my bits. But luckily everything was okay, at least something to be thankful for. After they regulated the hormones and I grew a bit more, I either grew into my clitoris or it shrank. And today I can't express how grateful I am that I was not subjected to a clitoral reduction with all the loss of sensation that might have involved. At four, I was taken into hospital. I was, for all intents and purposes, perfectly healthy. Didn't feel ill, so I was quite worried and terrified of, why am I going into hospital? Uh, the next minute I'm going in and I have surgery, and I was absolutely terrified. I woke up in a lot of pain. Didn't know what was happening. Nobody would tell me. They just said, Ooh, it's for your own good when you're older. And that was it. And it was excruciatingly painful. And I went from being a sort of happy, sort of gen general, sort of normal child to being quite shy and sort of worried after that of what was going to happen to me because nobody would talk to me. At around 13, 14, I asked the surgeon again what he'd done to me. Well, I actually said, what the hell have you done to me? I was so angry and upset that I'd been kept in the dark. But all he would still say was, you don't need to know, it's not important. You'll find out when you're old enough to get married. She had surgery, oh, age of 18 months, I think, something like that. And talking to the consultant about it, this was either at the time or later on, his view always was that Mary should be told everything about herself. They obviously gave me the initial talks when I was 11 and 13, uh, and then really left up to me, which was just fantastic, so I could ask questions as I wanted. Um, and they also didn't pressure me into finding out everything possible about it, which was really sort of threatening and it was very good and there was just sort of no secrets between us so they told me everything. I got in touch with the support group when I was 18. Um, I, they agreed to send me some information and this fateful day I suppose big brown envelope arrived and I took it off to my bedroom and I opened it in private and read through it and I was partly shocked and partly relieved. Uh, partly relieved in that I never knew, knew what my condition was exactly and why I'd had the surgery and that it was an intersex condition and also very shocked and sort of horrified that nobody had had the decency to tell me about it as I was growing up. Uh, I challenged my mother about it and she was very upset and basically it was at this time she said, well, for three weeks we didn't know whether you was a boy or a girl and they thought you was a boy and while they were doing the tests you were called Nicholas but then all the tests came back with XX chromosomes so I am female but with the ambiguity of enlarged clitoris looking slightly penile and <laughs> the doctors decided not to tell me or my parents that it was an intersex condition because they 
think that you will grow up psychologically unbalanced and unable to cope with the condition. So they think, well, you don't need to know about it. You have the surgery, you're fixed, and that's it. It's not important. Over the years, at each medical checkup, there was a new bit of bad news. First time they said, by the way, we had to take your womb out as well. That wasn't properly developed. The next time I came along, they said, well, your vagina's quite short. We don't know if you'll ever be able to have sex, but we can do something for you. You can either have a bit of your bum taken off and inserted inside, or we can cut your labia, sew them together, and extend your vagina externally. Thank goodness I didn't take them up on any of these kind offers. The last thing they told me, which really freaked me out, was that promiscuous men would find me really attractive. That's just the sort of thing a 16-year-old girl wants to hear, the thought of these dirty old men wanting to have a grope. When I was 18 and left home, the consultant gave me a letter. In it, she said that I had had my ovaries and womb taken out because they were underdeveloped at the age of 14 and hormone replacement therapy had been started. I took this letter with me on my year off between school and university. And when I met my new boyfriend, I told him what I knew. This was 26 years ago, and today he's my husband. After about eight weeks, we slept together for the first time. And it was quite difficult because the hymen was so scarred, presumably after these tests, um, that he couldn't penetrate to begin with. This took about three months. He was very gentle and understanding, very patient, and I felt totally loved and accepted. I really blossomed. I couldn't believe my luck. I think my doctor's attitude towards my treatment also reflected the, the morality of their time and place. Uh, my first doctor, he said that I might need a vaginoplasty, but he said to wait until I was ready to get married before we could talk about it. Ten years later, I was in California where the attitude towards sexuality is quite different. And the doctor said, well, I might need or I might not need a vaginoplasty, but to find out on my own by using a dilator and by even uh, trying to have intercourse. Um, I did both things and uh, there was no problem whatsoever. So I was quite glad that neither of my doctors pressured me into having a surgery. And I was able to find that I didn't need one after all. At the age of 14, I went to see the surgeon for a checkup. It was about six to eight weeks after the final surgery. I was only just about 14. And the surgeon did a vaginal examination, which was extremely uncomfortable. And the next thing, he turns around, rummages in a cupboard and comes up with this, what they call a dilator and literally rammed it into me, and I nearly shot on the ceiling. The pain was excruciating, because I'd still not healed up from the surgery. And he said, do this 10 minutes, three times a day for the rest of your life, or until you get a partner, or get married, basically. No explanation, that was it. All these, it's for your own good, and that was it. And each time I went to see him, he would then give me further sizes of them, and they graduated up. But it was extremely embarrassing. At 14, not knowing what was being done to you, the pain of doing the treatment, my parents thought it was some sort of abuse, like basically masturbation, but it's not. It's to stop the tissues closing up, stretching them, and hopefully to get a more adult size as you're growing up, to be able to use tampons and to allow sexual intercourse. Three or four years ago, I was given vaginal dilators to uh, make me bigger inside, and uh, I didn't actually, I used them for a little bit, but then stopped because they were very painful um, and made me think about things I didn't really like to think about. Um, and I don't know whether that was a mistake to stop using them, but I, I suppose I'll find out, I don't know. When I went to the Middlesex Hospital in my early 30s for a second opinion on the surgery and to find out exactly what was done to me, they reintroduced me to dilation treatment with modern dilators 
uh, supposedly to help me in the future to have a less painful, intimate sex life. And these were the kit that they give you nowadays. And uh, it basically comes with gel and a cleaning brush, and then you get a handle to put them on. They're plastic rather than glass, so they're safer and you've not got the worry of breaking them. Which are basically <laughs> made of acrylic plastic in graduated sizes up to so-called average male. <laughs> Anatomy being the larger one. When I was 35, I decided it was time to face the facts. This wasn't really because I was particularly brave, but things weren't going well in my marriage. I tried to contact the medics who'd been involved with me in childhood, but most of them had died. One was still alive, and he put me in touch with an endocrinologist. He explained to me that because my cells could not react to male hormones, the Y chromosome couldn't take effect and I had been born a girl. He also told me that the so-called ovaries, which were removed at 14, were not ovaries at all, but were underdeveloped testes, which they'd had to look for in the abdomen, which was why they'd needed to make such a big cut. I was tremendously relieved after he told me everything because the truth was manageable. This was my diagnosis, my body, my life, and I had been told nothing but a pack of lies. I was furious with my parents. When I was diagnosed, there were the two aspects, the infertility and the fact that I had an intersex condition. At that age, uh, being infertile did not really strike me. It was mostly dealing with the other issue of uh, body image and being comfortable with what I was. For my parents, infertility was the main uh, thing because they knew that it would affect me later in life. They still had hopes that somehow some medical treatment would be available and I had to convince them that uh, there wasn't anything about this. It's only been much later that I've been able to cope with infertility. As an adult, when I eventually got to see these new clinicians, I found out that I'd basically had three or four vaginoplasties and a total clitorectomy. And it was like the final piece of the jigsaw slotting into place. The surgery for the clitorectomy actually cut the nerve endings, the glands out of the clitoris, some of the erectile tissue, but most of it was left tied back under the skin to the pubic bone. And then when or if I get aroused, it tightens up and pulls away from that bone and causes extreme excruciating pain. And that is something I'm left with for the rest of my life. There's nothing that can be done about that. The surgery has had a devastating effect on my sex life. So the vaginoplasty has left deep scarring and visible scarring on the outside. Uh, lack of sensation and pain because of the narrowing of the tissues. Clitorectomy causes a great deal of pain as well. and very little pleasurable sensation is left, probably about 5% pleasurable sensation to 95% pain, because the surgery that was supposed to fix me and make everything rosy and great has actually had the opposite effect and made it very difficult. Um, penetrative sex is just a nightmare. <laughs> With the help of good old classical Freudian psychoanalysis, I've been able to face the possibility that there might be something male in me, whatever that might mean. I think I've done quite a good job at integrating male and female attributes. And I've since discovered that so many people who don't have intersex conditions do just the same after a midlife crisis. 
I've always felt female, but I do accept the condition is intersex in that you look as when you're born neither male nor female and a bit ambiguous. But I don't see myself as neither one thing nor the other. I've always felt female, albeit failed female in that society and the medical profession have failed me in what they've done to me and that is the only aspect that I see it as intersex. Uh, I feel female and always have. After I was diagnosed, I was a bit worried that my lack of ultra-femininity meant that I wasn't uh, a girl anymore. But after I went to college, I found a lot of other women without any uh, intersex condition who shared my ideas and who shared my, my groove in this um, femininity um, range. And it became much easier to understand that the notions of femininity don't have necessarily anything to do with one's gender identity. Um, having a S doesn't really make me feel um, a part of the intersex community in general. Um, it, you know, when I'm with people who have intersex conditions, it doesn't make me think, oh, thank God I'm home or whatever. Um, but I do sort of think about the gender issues that it raises. Um, quite a lot so um, you know I, wear, I have short hair and I wear boyish sort of clothes and I have lots of male friends and uh, do kind of kind of boyish activities but then you know other times I sort of wear a dress and love it and feel really girly and it's it's great um, but then other times I wear a dress just to conform to expectations so it's a bit of a mix um, when I look back on being assigned as a girl when I was very young. I think sort of for practical purposes that was certainly the best thing to do because I'm much, much closer physically to a girl than a boy. Um, but sort of emotionally it, it, it might not be so accurate. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, yeah, but in the end I suppose I think it's a good idea. What I don't understand is why people who are normally so willing to accept that each human being is unique are suddenly so afraid of variation and faced with the fact that between the conventional extremes of what we understand as being male and female, there are endless shades of variety. It's ironic that the title of this program is Gender Trouble because there isn't any gender trouble for me or for many of my friends who have intersex conditions. It might be trouble for other people to uh, accept our genders or how we see ourselves, but not for us.